So this week we are talking about functions. And functions are our second foray into reusability. And um, if you had an opportunity to watch my video from last week, um, you will know that reusability is my favorite topic when it comes to programming. And last week we learned how to have our uh, loop code, and that loop code was about allowed us to reuse the same the, the same set of code again and again and again. Well, this week we're going to have more reusability, and again, it's not copying and pasting. It's allow us to write a section of code and use that that grouping of code as many times as we want, but this time we get to name it. That's really what a function is. It is a named block of code. And um, it really does reduce the amount of code you have to write and maintain if you structure your code for reusability. And now we get to name it. I was ahead of myself. So the basics of a function. We're grouping code, and that's all it is. It's a named group of code that has a specific purpose. And um, so the function name is in the global scope, but the function body is in the local scope. And this is really our, it's really our second time doing data-driven code because the outcome, the results of the processing from the function will change based on what data it has to process. So, the basics of a function part one. We have a new keyword called def. Def tells Python, expect a function definition. Next. And um, when, when Python sees a def, what it's going to do is it's going to read all the lines in that function from the, um, from the definition line until that function until the end of the function, and it's just going to kind of put them in a library and keep them. It's not going to execute it because def says just define it. It doesn't say call it. So then we have the name of the function. Now, function names are, are just a name. They do have to follow certain rules. They can't, they have to start with a letter, and it's almost identical to the rules for variables in Python. Then you have a local scope. So you have a code block. And again, like loops, you know that it is a code block. It's a local scope because it is indented at least one from the outer definition. Last week, week three, we were talking about if, elif. Local scope was tabbed in at least once from those keywords. The same with loops last week. If you had um, the local scope for a loop, it was always indented one. Exact same thing for functions. It's if you have to start by indenting at one, and in fact, if you don't, you'll get an error, and I'm going to show you that error in a little bit. The other thing you have with the function definition is parentheses. So after the name, at a minimum, you have to have an open and closed parentheses. Now, you can also have stuff in between them, and we're definitely going to get into that. And then finally, you have to end with the colon. Just like if statements, just like loops, functions have to end. The definition line has to end with a colon, or you're going to get an error, a syntax error. And by the way, this is just, if you want to follow along or look at it, this is challenge 5.1.1, and it's just print pattern. So all we're doing in here is we're defining a function, and we're going to print something from that function. Now, this, isn't a, this doesn't even begin to show you the power of what functions can do, and functions are, can definitely be longer than a single line of code. This is just the beginning of describing how to define a function, and uh, we're about to talk about how to call one too. A function definition is always started with def, 
function requires open and closing parentheses. Those are the two rules. So that was part one. Part one is the function definition. Part two is calling the function. So somewhere else after the function has been defined, because Python is reading this code from the top to the bottom, even if you do compile it, um, the definition of the function has to be there before the call. So the definition of this of print pattern is there, just like we saw it on the other side. But now we've added print underscore pattern, open and close parentheses. That is the function call. At that moment, Python is going to say, okay, you're calling this function. There's the function. I can match it to something I've already read into my library. So I'm then going to execute. So it's going to output star, 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 star. So there's two parts of functions. There's the definition, and then there's the call. The definition has to happen before the call. Now, if you're thinking about the functions like range that you used um, for for loops, why didn't you have to define them first? That is because Python gives us just a massive amount of predefined functions that we can use, just like when you're converting something to an int and you use the int function. That is predefined in Python, so we didn't have to define it. Python gave it to us. That's why we don't see a def int in our code. Python, as the compiler, is giving it to us. But when we're defining them ourselves, the function definition has to be before the function call. So, and I can call that function as many times as I want. I can call it and twice and it's going to go up. And it's going to say print pattern. It's going to do the exact same thing again. It's going to print another, in this case, line of stars. And I can do that and put that in a loop and call it as often as I want. Um, but that's part two. It must be defined before it's used, and a function is called using its name. Uh, so let me stop for a quick second, and we're going to use the debugger a lot this week, so we're not going to do that. What do we want? Here is a modified. Um, 5.1.1, and I just modified it because I think someone probably asked me, can you do this in a for loop? And so you can. So ignore the yellow squiggly lines. It just doesn't like that. I think I haven't put a space or something there and a space there. Yeah. It didn't like that I didn't have the spaces the way it liked. Anyway, so I want it, what I want to do is I'm going to send this into the debugger. And I've got two breakpoints here. I've got a breakpoint at line three, which is the first executable line in function print pattern. And then I've got a breakpoint at line seven, which is the, the for loop. So I'm going to edit the configuration. We're going to do 511. And I'm going huh. wait a minute, where are you? Oh, there it is. Okay, so I want you to watch where that blue line shows up, where the debugger line shows up. And when I hit the debugger, the first line of code that it stops at is line seven. It did not stop at line three. That is because Python reads anything in that is underneath the, the function definition, but it doesn't actually do anything with that code until you call it. So I'm going to step over the four, and now I'm going to call print pattern. Now watch where the blue line goes again. So now I'm stepping over print pattern, and I go back 
to line three, I go to the first executable line in the function. And then I'm going to step over that. It's going to show you what it's going to print out. I added another printout here at some point in time. Now I'm back in my loop. I go up to the top of the loop. I'm at one. I'm going to call print pattern again. I'm going to step over print pattern, which is going to take me into the body of the print pattern function. So then I'm going to print my two lines. I'm now at two, and I'm done. So I want to mess this up a bit. I want to break this. I want to make it work a little differently. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to backspace. Now, I start getting all those wonderful red lines that PyCharm will give me. And if I attempt to debug it, I'm going to have an indentation error because it was expecting the first line after the def, after the function definition, to be indented, and I didn't indent it properly. So when I go back and do that, it's fine. So now I'm going, I don't know why that wasn't in line. Now I'm going to do something else. Okay, I'm going to unindent this. Now you will see that I don't have any errors. PyCharm is going to run this just fine. However, if I look at the console, okay, the first thing that happens is I've got four pound signs printed out. I didn't have that before. Why do I have that? I have that because by removing that tab, I removed the I, I removed the print fun, the print call with the pound signs from the print pattern function. It is no longer in the local scope of the print pattern function. So it's just going get, to get executed because I moved this into the global scope simply by, by removing the tab. It had been here, and when that was there, I'm going to stop and rerun. I'm not going to run it through the debugger. I get the expected result. Okay? When it's here and I run it, I get a completely different result. I get pounds out first and then I get two lines with stars. Completely different results simply because I moved it from the lo from the global scope. It's right, it, right now it's in the global scope and I just moved it to the local scope. So be careful. I often see students start writing functions and then they have something that is out of that they, they just forget to tab and their their project may not work right their lab may not work right so be very clear of what has to be inside the function because it has to be tabbed at least once okie dokie so Part three for function calls. Functions can have something called parameters. And a parameter is simply a piece of data that is passed into the function. And it's just a variable name. So what do we have here? We have our def, which tells Python to find a function, or I'm about to define a function. The name is print total inches. I have an open parenthesis, and then I have num feet, comma, num inches. Those two are parameters. They are parameters because they are inside the open and closing um, brick, the open and closing parentheses for the function. And what those are, those are just variables. They are variables that will exist only in the local scope of the function and will have a value given to them when the function is called. And you have to sub, sub uh, sorry, you have to separate all parameters by commas. And then in this case we're going to have 
the local code block, which is going to be total inches, and it's going to do a calculation, and then it's going to print total inches. So a parameter is a variable that, is, that exists only inside the local scope of the function. The value of a parameter is provided when you call the function. So we don't know what these values are yet because we, don't, we, we can't see the function call. We haven't gotten that far talking about functions part three. So we're about to talk about that now. So I've got my function definition. Now I'm going to input, I'm going to run my Python program. I'm going to have num underscore feet is int input. So I'm expecting someone to input an integer. Num underscore inches is int input. I'm expecting someone to give me another integer. So what you will see then is on the print total inches function call, which is right after um, the two input statements, I'm going to call them with two variables, num feet and num inches. Now this num feet and num inches is not the same num feet and num inches as is in the function definition. But what they will do is they will transmit those numbers to the function definition when the function is called. So I'm going to have, uh, I put in 5 and 8. So when I call the function, I'm going to say num feet, which is I put in 5, and it's going to then send 5 to the first variable, and it's going to send 8 to the second variable when I call the function. And then basically I'm just going to use them like I would use any other variable. So num feet is 5, num inches is 8, and so my output of total inches is going to be 68. Okay. Now, function parameters are positional. Function, sorry, arguments. When you call a function, you pass it arguments. Those arguments are positional. They are not based on the name. The name has nothing to do. A function, one thing to note, a function call needs to have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function. So if I defined two parameters, then I need to have two arguments calling it. I need to have two values or variables that contain values in the function call. They have to match sometimes. Mm -hmm. Let this rule sink in right now, and then I'm going to show you a caveat to that rule in a little bit. So arguments in order. So we just saw this, and we have our print total inches function. Nothing has changed there. So the only thing that is going to change is I am now changing num inches with num feet. So I'm going to put in my 5 and my 8 again. So num feet is 5, num inches is 8. What do you think happens when I call the function? So when I call the function, it's positional. So that 5 goes to num inches in the, the function itself. So the names don't matter. They just don't. So when I do this calculation, and remember the only thing I did was switch those two arguments, I'm going to get a very different answer. I'm going to have 8 times 12 plus 5, and in this case I'm getting 101. So Arguments are positional. Let's go out and do a little playing around with that. Yes. Hi, Noor. I do not make the slides themselves available. I do make all of the scripts available that we go over in this class. All of these scripts and um, slides for the labs, when we go through the pseudocode for the labs, I will also make those available, but I don't make the whole slide presentation available as a keynote presentation. Okay, that's fine. Do you know where I can get those, or 
Well, yes, I, let me let me put up my YouTube channel. Wrong person. Hold on. Switch account. Okay. Is your internet bill make you anxious? Not me. Okay, so this is my YouTube channel, and I will put that in the chat. So what what I have here, and I'll just do this real quick, is I keep a, about three years worth of videos here. So if you ever, if in case I may have said one thing on one year and one thing on a different year, I put all of the videos up um, on the channel. It usually is there by Friday, hopefully. And if I go so, through something like this, what you'll do is if you look at the description, you will see all of the uh, link to the Google Drive, which has all of the different um, scripts, any additional scripts that I've written that weren't part of the challenges, it will have the pseudocode, and if I did flowcharts, it will have flowcharts for each of the labs. So let me put this, let me put that in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Let's do this again. Uh Okay, so now I'll put the right thing in the chat, not something I was typing into Word. So there you go, and um, these are up every Friday. The only time you won't see a new one up is if I have said I can't make it or if I come in and nobody's shown up by about 10 after 9. So let's go back to PyCharm, and we're going to do 5-2-3. So... Um, this is pretty much what we saw on the slide, and I want to do something here. Um, well, I did, I did it already. I changed these variable names, and I changed those variable names just so that people could see. There we go. That they don't matter. So if I... Five, two, three. So, if I debug this, what we will see is, let me make this actually just a bit smaller. What we see is, again, I have a breakpoint at line six, but I didn't stop there because this is simply a definition. It's just a bunch of words that Python is reading into its internal library, and it's going to hold it there and wait and see what happens. So I have feet, and I'm going to put in 10 feet, and I have inches, and I'm going to put in 10 inches. Well, that wasn't very good. I'm going to put in 7 inches, and hold on, let's do that, 7 inches. So now I'm going to call print total inches. Now, by the way, when you are, if you're in PyCharm and you're working on any of your projects or if you have copied your Zybooks code into PyCharm to help you debug it, here is a new uh, arrow in the debugger. Up till now, we've always done step over. This is step into. Even if I didn't have that breakpoint in line six, I could step into and I would go to the very first line in the function. So this is step over. If I did a step over and there was a breakpoint, I would end up in the same place. But if I don't have a breakpoint, I can just step into it. So in this case, I'm going to have, so I'm going to step uh, variables, that's what I wanted. So I have num feet is 10 and num inches is 7. And I'm going to calculate it and I'm going to print it. So I'm going to be 127 is going to be the total inches. So now I'm, I am about to do the same function call, but I've swapped it. I've now inches and feet. So I'm going to step in. I'm now back at line 6, which is the first line inside the local scope of the function. 
and I'm going to do my calculation and I'm going to get 94. Now, this is what we mean by data driven code. Okay? You saw how print total inches changed based on the code that I was passing in. So, if you can create code that gives you the right output based on whatever your input is within a reasonable range, then you write less code. You have less code to maintain. And that's very important when you're a programmer. How do you pinpoint a positional issue? What do you mean by positional issue? Do you mean that, that it's not tabbed correctly? So when you said that it was, if you swap feet and inches the way you did that, how would you know when that's the problem, when you're essentially debugging, I guess? Well, what you would do is, um, if you're dealing with the lab, Zybooks is going to give you the wrong answer. If you have written your own code and you would expect that the answer would come out in a certain way. So if I am writing a function in my daily life, I write test code for that function. So I have a different script and that script calls in and uses those functions and I pass in values that I know and then I also expect the answer. And so if that test code calls my function and it doesn't match the answer I'm expecting, I've either got a positional problem with the arguments or I've got a logic error. So in my day job, that's how I would do it. I would have test code where I know the answer. And I'm expecting my code to give me that answer. And if it doesn't give me that answer, there's a problem with my code. It could be positional arguments. It could be logic. If you are, so if, always test your code with something you expect. So if you're doing like the Zybooks lab, because this is, this lab, one of the labs this week is very, it's, it's almost identical, except you're creating a function to a lab you did in week three. If you are not getting the output that Zybooks is telling you, I would start by going back and looking at the position of the arguments that you're sending in or the position of the return codes that you're getting back because we're going to go to that. Um, so I hope that answer makes sense. It did, thanks. No problem. So function part four, we're going to return values. So we've got data going in. I used to work with a woman who, no, I'm not joking, she, she was a boss of mine. She had three PhDs in math. And the one thing that I learned from her, or one of the things that I learned from her, was her terminology. And what she always said is you have goes intas and goes outas. So we just talked about the goes intas, the parameters and the arguments. Now we're going to talk about the goes outas, because just like you can pass inches and feet, whatever, into a function, you can get a piece of information out of the local scope of that function back to whoever called it. And that is called a return. Because that's what you're doing. You're returning a piece of data. So again, we have the keyword def. We have a function name, in this case, pyramid volume. Now pyramid volume has three parameters, base length, base width, pyramid height, inside the parentheses, and of course we always end it with a colon. Then in the local scope, we have two lines of code. We're going to do our fancy dancy math calculation for printing the, the pyramid, the volume of the pyramid, and then we're going to return that. Well, why would we want to return a piece of data? Because maybe something farther down in our chain of scripts needs that piece of data for some reason. Functions are really about taking 
some concept, some small concept, not, not always small in number of lines of code, but a concept of code and turning it into a black box. You know what goes in and you know what comes out and you know that the right answer will happen. And so we don't care what happens on the inside. We just care that the pyramid volume that we're getting back is correct. And I don't want to have this calculation for pyramid volume 100 places in my code. I want to have it one. Because what if some handy-dandy math person like the woman I used to work with who had three PhDs in math, what if she came in and say, oh, no, 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 we were wrong. Okay. See that 1.0? That 1.0 should have been 1.22. I don't want to have to go find every place in my code that had that 1.0 for this pyramid volume calculation and change it. I want to change it in one place, and then every place that uses this function has that change. So we have a new keyword. Our new keyword is called return, and that's its job. It is taking a piece of data that is inside of a variable, in this case the variable's name is pyramid, and it is making it available in the global scope. Because pyramid exists only in the local scope of the pyramid volume function. But I want to use that pyramid volume someplace else that may have very little relation to what's going on in this particular function. The way I do that is I pass the variable back using the return. So basically I'm taking something that is in the local scope of the function and I'm making it available to whatever the scope was from the function call. And you do have to have that return statement. So it's used exclusively inside a function block. You will not find the word return used anywhere else. So here is how we return from a function. So in this case, I have my pyramid volume function. And I'm going to put in the length, I'm going to put in the width, and I'm going to put in the height. They're all floating point numbers. So then I'm going to call. So I've got my length, I've got my width, I've got my height, and now I'm going to call pyramid volume. So I'm going to pass those data, those data in, they're my goes into, and then I'm going to do my calculation, and I'm going to return the value for pyramid, which is the result of that calculation, and this is 9.45. So 9.45 goes to a variable called pyramid, and it's completely different from the variable called pyramid on the in the local scope of the pyramid volume function. This is a different thing. It's a different space in Python's memory. And that value is going to be 9.45, and then I'm going to print it. So you call a function by using its name and providing arguments. Any member, uh, sorry, I always remember to define a variable for the function call to be used as the return value. So pyramid, that's down here under height, is a variable. I know it's a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign just happens to be a function call. It could be anything that is that would normally be on the right-hand side of a function call. In this case, it is a, sorry, the right-hand side of an equal sign. In this case, it's our function call. And what Python is doing is we're saying, okay, Python, when we get that return value, assign that value to the variable pyramid. So that's what a return does. Now, um, we're going to do a little bit more with return, and I'll do it, I'll do the Python, I'll do the PyCharm stuff in a bit. So we're going to talk very briefly about Python objects. Everything in Python is an object under the hood, including a function. 
Um, and objects have three things. They have a type, they have an identity, and they have a value. Um, everything in Python is an object, including a function. So functions are objects. The identity of the function is its name. The parameters are its values. And its type is the return. So if this returns a floating point, then the type would be floating point. If, and, and you need to know that in case you're going to use that in further calculations. If you're expecting floating point and it returns you a string, you're going to throw an exception. You're going to have a problem. Things just aren't going to work. They're going to just stop. So you have to understand those three things. We already talked about identity, which is the name, parameters, which are the values, but the type is, is based solely on the return, whatever it's returning. Now, some people are clever or try and be clever, um, and they, they might have it, you know, one return line because Python's not a strongly typed language. Maybe they're going to return the word bad or the value of pyramid. You have to be able to understand that. My suggestion is never do that. You should have one return type. OK, so I've been talking about scope. I should have put this in the beginning again. Um, we have the local scope, which is a variable defined in the class or a function. The global scope, which is what we've already been, we've, we've talked about a lot in this class. And don't worry about the built-in. So a bit more about scope. The function name is always in the global scope. It is never in a local scope. You should never have a function definition inside an if statement. Python will let you do that, and it won't give you a syntax error, but it won't work the way you're expecting it. When you're defining functions, define them at the beginning of your script. or Define them in your own script and create a module. But you should never be defining a function inside of a function or a function inside of a loop or a function inside of an if statement. Function definition should always be in the global scope unless it's a module and then it's in the global scope of the module. Okay, parameters are local. And I know I've talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to go over it one more time because I think it will help when it gets to the point where you guys are starting to write your functions this week. Parameters are local scope. Even though they exist on the, the definition, and that definition, the name is in the global scope, the values for those parameters are only going to exist in the local scope, and they can only be used in the local scope of the function. OK, all processes are inside the local scope of the function. So anything that happens once it's indented is local scope. The return is also local scope, but it's a transition point. It allows you to move from the local scope to the global scope. The function call can be from any scope. It, it Here, it's in the global scope. It could be in the local, we could do a function call from the local scope of a function, from the local scope of an if statement, from the local scope of a loop. The function can call can be in whatever scope it needs to be. And the arguments are available from the same scope as the function call. So they could be the global scope. They could be, you know, wherever that call is, that's what's available to use as arguments. Okay. Arguments and mutability. So I have a function called swap. And that swap is going to take a list of things. And it's going to want to swap the last element for the first element and the first element for the last element. So this is a standard swap. This is the way all swap functions work. You create a temporary variable. You put the first thing you're going to swap out into that variable. Then you're going to um, take that variable 
and set it to what you want it to be, and then you're going to take the temp and set it into place of the original thing. So here I am inputting a list. Here good things just end all. And I want to swap those. So I want to swap the first and the last. And what I want it to come out with is all good things, just and here. Now will you will notice, and actually I think I'm just going to do this in PyCharm because I think it will make it easier. There's no return statement in swap. Yes. Um, I don't think so. Let's maybe my slides are wrong. Let me, let's actually run that. What was it? It was three. Which one was that? Pyramid volume. It, it could simply be that my, uh, that my math is wrong. I'm not the best math person in the world. So let's just run this and see if it was my math real quick. And then we'll go back to the other stuff. Okay. So I'm going to debug this. I'm going to put in what my values. Hold on. 4.5, 2.1, and 3.0. Okay. So we're going to put in 4.5, 2.1, and 3.0. So, whoops. Let's do this again. Don't know what I did. That's what I did. I forgot to hit the enter key. So now I'm going to call it. So what is my pyramid? 9.45, that's what the calculation says. So I'm going to go with Python being right. And we can talk about the math later. Okay, so where are we? We are down here. So I'm going to do 5.33. No problem. I'm going to do 5. Point, what's, wait, no, 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 that's not the one I want. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to do 5.12.1 because this is talking about mutability. Because sometimes you don't have to have a return value. So if we look at this code, I have, sorry about that, I have a function called swap. And I want to swap the first and the last. And, but right now, swap doesn't return anything. I don't put it into a new variable. So how am I going to get stuff back that I swapped? You, sometimes you don't have to. Sometimes the object that you pass into the function is mutable, which means Python's going to go out, it's going to change it in place in memory, and you're just going to get it because you're both pointing to the same place in memory. And that's what happens here because it's a list. List objects, dictionary objects are mutable, which means that unless you specifically make a copy in memory, it's always going to point to the same place. So here, what we will see is, let's edit the configuration. Uh, there we are. So we're going to go to the debugger. And I'm going to input, what was it, console, um, um, good is all. Okay. And I wanted to really read all is good. So I'm going to call swap values. And let's watch what happens in the variables 
to my list, okay? So I'm going to say temp equals swap. So now the temp is good, so it's equal to the first one. I'm going to say the first index of swap now has to equal the last index of list of swap. So now you're going to see that list changed in place. I didn't make a copy of it. It is just changing it in the memory of Python, and both the global scope and the local scope are pointing to the same place in memory. They're going to point to the exact same list. It's not making a copy of it. So then I'm going to say list to swap. The end of it is going to equal temp, and I'm going to have all is good, and it's going to print all is good. That's what we mean by mutability. No, Python doesn't ever tell you when to swap. We tell you when to swap. You decide that you need to swap, that your arguments aren't in the right order, um, that you need to sort it a different way for a display. So this is just the way to swap. Swapping is done the same. You you have and that's what all, that's all I meant by it. you have a temporary variable. You put one of the things you want to swap in the temporary variable. You swap those two, and then you put the thing in the temporary variable back to the to the place that it needs to be. That's all I meant by the swap is always the same. Um, default parameter values. Remember when I said that you always have to have the exact number of um, arguments as you do parameters most of the time? Well, this is the difference. And the difference is that Python allows you to have what they call default parameter values. So just like in week four, when we were li looking at the range function and the start and the, and the increment, were optional, so you only had to have one number, or you could have two numbers, or you could have three numbers. The way we could do that was by using default values. So if I have number of pennies, and I'm going to pass in dollars and pennies, and I want to get back the number of pennies, and I'm going to return dollars times 100 plus pennies, but Sometimes I don't want to just pass in pennies. So the way I do that is I define a default parameter value. And in this case, it's going to be zero. The way this looks is the parameter name is like any other parameter name. And then you say equal and then the value that you want it to equal to. And in this case, I want it to equal to zero. I don't need you to pass in pennies if there aren't any pennies. And what that does is Python says, okay, they're calling number of pennies, and I've got an argument that doesn't have a default value, so it has to, in fact, be before any arguments that do. So I expect there to at least be that parameter, or sorry, that argument. But there's a second parameter that has a default value, so I don't need a second argument. So I can have print number of pennies. I'm going to input four, and it's going to assume that that four is the dollars, and it's going to return 400. And that's what it's going to print out. So now I can say print number of pennies, and I'm going to take two input statements. And I'm going to input 5, and I'm going to input 6. So it's going to say dollars times 100, so it's going to be 5, and it's going to be 6. So I'm going to have 506 pennies. So I've just called the same function two different ways. All function parameters may have a default value. However, all function parameters with, that do not have a default value have to occur first in the function definition 
before any parameters that have default values. When you have a function that has a default value, you do not, the call does not need to include an argument with that value. And it makes it very easy. It, it makes it nice. Not all languages give you the opportunity to have um, default values. And it just makes it um, so that you're having to do less of you know putting if I have if I don't have pennies equal zero and there are instances or maybe a lot of instances where I'm just going to have to put pennies equal zero for the argument or zero for that argument it's just easier uh, on the coder uh, to have a default parameter I have default parameters whenever I possibly can so Python is one of the few languages out there that allows you to have multiple return values. So, and that's that's wonderful. Um, and this one really isn't that good. I don't really like this one, but we'll do it anyway. So, what what is a multiple return value? You can have multiple variables returned in the same uh, on the same line. You can't do that in Java. You can't do that in C and C++. You have to create a special structure to handle those. But in Python, you don't. In Python, you can return as many as you need. Now, you don't want to go crazy, but one of our labs is going to use a long multi-return statement. So basically what you have, here we have a list. We have one, two, three, and we have four, five, six. And I'm just going to do my standard swap. But in this case, I'm swapping from list 1 to list 2 and list 2 to list 1. And then I'm going to return list 1. And I'm going to return list 2. Now, you'll notice with these arrows, after it did the swap, that I have two variables on the left-hand side of that single equals line. You have to have the same number of variables as you do. Um, you have to have the same number of variables to the left of the single equal sign as you do to the right of the return statement. So I have two variables. I have list one and list two to the right of the return statement. So I have to have two variables, in this case L1 and L2, to the left of that single equal sign that you have to have that or you'll get an error. And then you can print them. So that's what a multi-return does. It saves you from having to create a structure. And when we do one of the labs this week, you're going to have to have a long return. Um, return values are positional. So there's nothing magical about the names. It is whatever's in that first return position, goes to whatever that first variable is that's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Oh, and the other thing you'll notice here is you have variable, comma, variable, single equal sign. You have to have that comma in between them. So Python knows that you're not making a mistake. So you've got to have that comma. Um, Python allows these multi-returns, and they're very handy. So we're going to go over the lab pseudocode. So here's our function swap. Maybe there was a reason we looked at swaps. And we're going to swap two parameters and we're going to return them. So you're going to swap parameter 1 for parameter 2 and parameter 2 for parameter 1. And then you're going to turn param 1 and return param 2. And the input is taking place in our main function. So this if underscore underscore name double equal sign main gives us a main function. Now you don't have to have that, but when we're starting to do functions, people start to like to use the main function. And that's how you define a place, the exact spot. This is how you define the exact spot where you want Python to start, is you define a main function, just like that. 
So once we've gotten it back, we have our multi equal sign, and then we're going to output one and two. Output one and output two. So we did that a couple of times. There's some code there that's using lists, but you don't have to use lists to do the swap. You can just not use lists and use normal variables. Okay. So remember the exact change from module three? Now we're doing it again, but we are making a function called exact change. So if you go back and you have your exact change from module three and it's right, copy it and start 5.19 with that code. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to define a function around the calculations. Okay? So the calculations are, you know, dollar, quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies, just like we had before. And then you have to return dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. This is that long multi-return statement. And you're going to return that to the global scope of your script. And then you're just going to print it. All of this stuff you've done before. So we're going to set the user value, the input value, and then we're going to set dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies equal to, i.e., single equal sign, the call to the exact change function, and we're going to pass it whatever the user input. And then, based on what we get back, dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, we're going to then do the print. All of this stuff you did on week three, the, the if statements, the nickel versus nickels, the dollar versus dollars, that's already done. As well as this stuff, this is already done. You just have to format it correctly and define a function and add the return statements. And then once you call that function, you have to make sure that you get back the right number of returns. So you don't have to rewrite this completely from scratch. Start with what you have from week three. And then add the functions to it. And uh, that's it. So does anyone have any questions? Oops. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Okay, everybody have a great weekend. I am going to end the stop the recording.